say I feel really intimidated because all these people were coming up here talking about all this great technology. And I'm not going to really be talking much about technology. I'm going to be talking about thinkology, um, how you think about things, how you think about images, how you think about race, how you think about journalism, and how all those things come together. So uh, we here in Florida, journalists here in Florida, know that we have a freight train coming our way that touches down on Monday. And that is the trial of uh, George Zimmerman, Neighborhood Watch volunteer, has been charged with murder in the shooting death of 17-year-old unarmed black teen Trayvon Martin. And one of the things that we found in sort of seeing how this uh, story came to fruition and how it was covered was that there's lots of lessons to be learned about how race and media and society all come together uh, that speak to the future of journalism. So we're gonna, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. One of the first things, um, I suppose I should take a step back and let's talk about the most accepted notion about diversity and journalism these days. When I teach these classes here at Pointer or when I talk to people or go to seminars, what do we say? We say greater diversity equals greater accuracy and fairness. I mean, that makes sense, right? If you have a newsroom that reflects the demographics and the personality of the community that it's covering, hopefully you do a better job of covering that community. So how do we know this? Well, we know this from bitter experience. We have seen how the suffragette movement, we've seen how the civil rights movement, we've seen how uh, other movements in the history of America have been undercovered or miscovered because the people who were covering them were mostly white males. And as a matter of fact, uh, there are at least three newspapers in the mid-2000s who issued apologies for their civil rights coverage because it was so misguided uh, and so uh, unfair uh, to the side of people of color who were trying to get rules changed, trying to get people signed up for voting rights, trying to, uh, to find equality in the system. But what if that notion isn't always true? I think what we've found, especially after the Zimmerman trial and as we get more diverse as a nation, as we get more diverse as an industry, that you kind of have to marry strong journalism values. You have to marry a sense of how race works in society and a, and a sense of how race and media come together to create that quality coverage that you really want. And especially in an age of fragmented media because we have so many media outlets that find success by articulating and championing a point of view, right? So we have to be very careful and make sure that we leverage diversity ethically. And my exhibit A is our biggest test, Trayvon Martin and my good friend Reverend Al. <laughs> As we look at how Trayvon Martin sort of came to, to prominence as a news story, we get a sense of how race and media and journalism sort of have this uneasy um, coexistence. Race was the engine that drove this story from the very beginning. What happened, of course, is that a Trayvon Martin was walking back to his um, father's girlfriend's house in, in uh, Sanford, Florida, ran into George Zimmerman, they had some kind of scuffle, and in the ensuing scuffle, Trayvon Martin was shot and killed. Now, uh, George Zimmerman was detained by the police and questioned, but he wasn't charged with the crime for almost a month and a half after it happened. And his family went public about, I want to say, 10 days after he was killed to say they felt that the police were dragging their feet on charging him with a crime because of race, because the Sanford Police Department had a history of not dealing with racial issues very well, and they were allowing this white guy to get away with killing their son. So from the beginning, race was the engine driving the story. Um, I often talk about missing white women syndrome. We know what that is, right? Uh, the media has a tendency to sort of champion and, um, and lionize and, and spend a lot of time on uh, stories about missing white women. And how do missing people of color get covered? They get covered uh, when there's stories about how they don't get covered, <laughs> right? So I think in the Trayvon Martin situation, what we saw was about, uh, was several days after Trayvon was killed, after it should have been a news story when he first died, his family came forward and said, we think there's a racial issue here. And then all of a sudden, the media could say, oh, well, now we get to cover the story. 
We didn't cover it when he got killed, but now we can cover the fact that the police don't seem to be investigating his case well, right? So right away we see one, one area where race and journalism kind of get tripped up. Now the reason why they said he was white, uh, George Zimmerman was white at first, was because the police said that he was white uh, in the initial police report. But we found out later that he self-identifies as Hispanic. Right, so he's he's uh, he's registered to vote as a Hispanic, and on his driver's license he's Hispanic. So all of a sudden, this very easy story that we thought we had, white guy shielded uh, by police system in Sanford, Florida, takes another turn. If George Zimmerman's not white, if he's Hispanic, does it matter? Is there still a racial issue? Are we talking about white supremacy or are we talking about something else? The New York Times even called him a white Hispanic for a while, which was accurate. But when's the last time you've seen a news story call somebody a white Hispanic, right? And then we saw two different images of assailant and victim emerge. First up top, we saw the initial photos of George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. Now, uh, Martin's family and his representatives say that the early photos that circulated in the press of Trayvon Martin were taken from the, the funeral uh, program. And that's why he looks so young. Uh, they say that he's 16 years old in that picture, but people have disputed that. Uh, George Zimmerman went into hiding after the, uh, the killing happened. And so the only photo that most press could get their hands on was a 2005 booking photo where he was a little more uh, overweight than he was when the event happened. And of course, he was in an orange jumpsuit. It's a mugshot, right? So people were saying, here you have this mugshot of this overweight guy, and you have uh, this picture of a kid who looks younger than the 17-year-old who was killed. Is that fair? But then we saw almost an overcorrection where we saw a lot of media outlets uh, unearth, try to unearth pictures that would tell a different story. So the Orlando Sentinel somehow got a picture of George Zimmerman from his work. Uh, and initially there was some confusion about whether or not any other media outlets could use it or how the Orlando Sentinel got it, right? So it took a while for that photo to spread, but there's a photo of him smiling. Uh, he's wearing a suit. Uh, he looks much more comfortable. But we also saw photos like the one on the right which some people said uh, was Trayvon Martin, but it was not. And in fact, uh, two websites, twitchy.com and Business Insider, had to run, had to run uh, corrections, saying we initially told you this was Trayvon Martin, uh, and it wasn't. So we saw a bit of an overcorrection, right? Uh, some uh, media outlets even went into his closed social media accounts and pulled out tweets and photos of Trayvon Martin uh, in, in order to provide a different picture. We saw this weird war of images uh, in a way that maybe we hadn't seen much before. And I think a lot of this happened because there's a central question at the heart of this story that uh, is maybe impossible to answer. And the question is, how did this fight start? Did Trayvon Martin attack George Zimmerman as he claims? Uh, as Zimmerman claims, or was he was Trayvon Martin uh, targeted because of his youth and because of his race? And did George Zimmerman uh, make him so uncomfortable and get in his face so much that Zimmerman started the fight? Unfortunately, there may be only two people who know the answer to that question, and one of them's dead, and one of them has a real good incentive for making the story look favorable to him, right? Uh, over there in the left is the picture is a picture of the rapper named The Game. And believe it or not, there's an email chain circulating saying that that's an accurate picture of Trayvon Martin. <laughs> that shows how far this war over images uh, has gone. And that's because people are scrambling for a narrative that explains what's going on. There's been so much pressure on news outlets to try and explain what happened. We saw during uh, early coverage, say uh, throughout March of last year, we saw people doing audio analysis of the 911 call. We saw people um, trying to get experts to figure out whether it was Trayvon Martin's voice uh, screaming for help at the end of some 911 call, uh, whether or not it was George Zimmerman screaming for help, whether or not George Zimmerman used some sort of racial epithet when he called police and was trying to tell them about Trayvon Martin, uh, whether or not uh, when there was initial video of 
uh, George Zimmerman being taken into the police custody. Um, it was blurry and people were trying to say, well, it doesn't look like he's injured. Maybe he didn't have a fight like he claimed. And then a sharper version came out and we could see that he was injured. There was all kinds of speculation because there's this central question uh, that journalists are having a hard time answering. Right? So what we saw happen was three colliding journalism values sort of come together uh, in this coverage of Trayvon Martin. Number one, we have the social justice imperative. Now, those of you who've been in journalism a while, you understand what this is. We're supposed to be the voice of the voiceless. We're supposed to stand up for the little guy. We're supposed to challenge big institutions, uh, particularly the government and particularly big business, and hold them accountable, right? So initial, especially the initial take on this story, the idea um, that there was a family that had lost uh, a child and they weren't getting the right response from government, they weren't getting the right response from the police, that's something that made us say, hey, you know, maybe there's a story there, right? So that's something that sort of clicked with us and made us want to focus on this story. Secondly, fuller context through diversity. One of the things we found that uh, uh, was effective in the early spread of the Trayvon Martin story is that a lot of African American columnists and journalists really championed this story. We saw people like Roland Martin on CNN. Uh, we saw people like uh, Tom Joyner on the radio. We saw people like Charles Blow in the New York Times. Um, we saw Ta-Nehisi Coates at the Atlantic. Uh, we saw Jesse Washington at the Associated Press and uh, Jonathan Capehart at the Washington Post. And they, they all did these affecting stories about what it was like uh, to worry about being uh, racially targeted, how to deal with race in society. Jesse Washington w wrote about teaching his 10-year-old son the black code, you know, how to, how to handle yourself when you're in public, how to handle yourself when the police pay attention to you. And in some ways that added fuller context. But uh, I noticed, for example, NBC had a lot of its uh, on-air people uh, of color talk about racial profiling at a time when it was an open question whether or not, I mean, Zimmerman certainly says that he didn't racially profile Trayvon Martin. So is it fair for people, especially people who aren't columnists, to do those kinds of stories and commentaries when Zimmerman is resisting the idea? And then finally, accurate, impactful coverage. We want to own the story of the moment as journalists, right? We want to be able to answer those unanswerable questions. We want to tell the story nobody's telling, which can sometimes push us into doing things like audio analysis, <laughs> which might be better left to other experts, right? When everyone wants you to pick a side who is an honest broker. I can tell you as somebody who did some cable television, I was on CNN, I was on some of these places trying to talk about Trayvon Martin, everybody wanted you to pick a side. So how do you find that line down the middle that you're supposed to articulate and keep to those journalism values when everybody wants you to pick a side and in fact their audience and profit in picking a side. Um, my good friend Reverend, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton is one of MSNBC's highest profile anchors but he also was a spokesman for Trayvon Martin's family uh, for quite a while when the story was uh, one of the most covered stories in the country. So what lessons did we learn? What I learned was the danger of proving racism. A lot of times when a story emerges and there's a racial component to it, the first thing we want to do is try to prove whether or not someone is racist. We want to find out, did George Zimmerman uh, wear a white sheet and go out and burn crosses on the weekends, right? But in a way, that's sort of asking people to reach into somebody's mind and figure out something about how they feel or think about something. I'm not so sure that that's possible. What we really should be doing is looking at the impact of their actions. Because what we know now is that even someone who thinks uh, that they're not racist, someone who believes in equality among the races, can, can be in a situation, be in a high crime neighborhood, see a person of color somewhere where they think they uh, shouldn't be, and maybe racially profile them, right? The other thing I learned is we only talk about race in a crisis, and that's a problem. It's so hard to get people to have these discussions about issues of difference that we try to have them all at once, right when we're in the middle of this really controversial murder where journalists are trying to get to the bottom of the facts. And I think one of the things that happened is we had all this commentary about racial profiling and about the history of the police department in Sanford and about how people get treated and about whether you can wear a hoodie. I mean, Geraldo, really? <laughs> whether you can wear a hoodie 
um, if you're a person of color, if you're a young person of color, all of that sort of confused the basic questions of the case, which was what happened, right? What happened? The myth of life pitfall. I remember talking to a news director um, at a local uh, affiliate, and he told me uh, that one of the pitfalls of news coverage is this idea that, this, uh, that there's a certain way that certain people's lives are supposed to unfold. And anything that disturbs that, that's news, right? So if you live in the suburbs and you get shot to death in your, in your, in your driveway, well, that's news, right? But if you live in South St. Pete, where people get shot every other day, and you get shot, well, OK, that's not news, <laughs> right? And what that means is that you end up overlooking news when it happens in some places, even when it's particularly jarring and particularly important, right? There's a lack of history. Uh, I saw a lot of coverage of the Trayvon Martin situation where journalists didn't seem to be aware of the history of tension between the black community in Sanford and the police department in Sanford. Uh, they weren't aware of the history of tension uh, between law enforcement in Florida uh, and black people and people of color, right? Uh, there's a lot of spotty incidents. Right? And if you're not aware of that, you might not understand why people are reacting the way they are. And then finally, there's avoidance. Right? Uh, as a person of color who's worked at a news organization for a long time, people come to me, hey, can you cover this? <laughs> I can tell you how to cover it. <laughs> so um, it's important to make sure that everybody gets involved in coverage, not just the people of color. Right? That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.